All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to CS 2050. The title of today's lecture is the Chinese Remainder Theorem. Chinese Remainder Theorem is an ancient piece of lore. Probably, if you were to make a tier list of all the theorems in number theory, most people would put Chinese Remainder Theorem at the top for Maslow Theorem is a theorem of all time. Chinese remainder theorem might be the coolest theorem of all time. Um, nobody really makes tier lists of the theorems of number theory, I guess. But uh, it's, a, it's ancient and historical, which is probably which is one of the reasons it's called Chinese remainder theorem. It's ancient versions of this theorem have been found from like 700 BC. But the story of why it's called the Chinese remainder theorem is uh, basically because the guy who wrote uh, the first about the Chinese remainder theorem in China was also called Sun Tzu. And Sun Tzu was also you know, that big general art of war. Uh, Sun Tzu has this story, or the mis it's a totally misattributed story, but basically he says something like he has an, he's amassed a large army of soldiers, and he wants to know how many soldiers he has. So he tells the soldiers, he calls out to them onto a giant megaphone, he says, all right, everybody get into groups of three, and we're going to count how many people are left over. Then we're going to get gather everybody into groups of five, and we're going to count how many people are left over. And we're going to get everybody into groups of seven, and then we're going to count how many people are left over. And simply by the remainders, is he able to calcu calculate the total number? The Chinese remainder theorem is basically this. And here's sort of the translation of this, which is, a, again, it's misattributed. It has nothing to do with soldiers. There are certain things whose number is unknown. If we count by threes, we have two left over. We have uh, two left over. If we count by uh, fives, we have uh, three left over. Uh, and if we count uh, by uh, seven, we have two left over. Uh, how many are there? So basically, you take a, a, a number. You, if we were to write this today, we would use modular arithmetic. x is some value we want to determine what x is. And we mod it by uh, two, three, uh, excuse me, 3, 5, and 7, and we can get uh, a certain value. So we know that x mod, x is congruent to 2 mod 3. x is congruent to 3 mod 5. And then x is congruent to 2 mod 7. What is x? So we're basically given a system of linear congruences. We want to solve for x here. We'll generalize this in a second, but let's see if anyone can brute force search. What is x? Give me one value of x that's congruent to 2 mod 3, 3 mod 5, and 2 mod 7. I don't know if anyone can brute force this, brute force this one quickly, but let's see. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Good job. I would not have gotten that. Twenty-three. Maybe you start with the biggest one. You're like, okay, seven, fourteen, twenty-one. So it's going to be nine, sixteen, twenty-three. Something. Try a few small values, and then you plug twenty-three into those. Maybe it works. You know, so that's probably a way to do it. Chinese remainder theorem is two things. First off, is that a solution exists uniquely, and it gives an algorithm to determine such a solution. We want to generalize this uh, finding a number. And it's important that x is a simultaneous, that 23 here, our solution, is a simultaneous solution. It's a solution to all of the inequalities, excuse me, all the linear congruences at the same time. Not some, most of them or some of them or something, all of them. Such a solution exists under certain conditions always. So here's the formal statement of the Chinese remaining theorem. Let n1, n2, dot, 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 nk, be pairwise relatively prime. So pairwise relatively prime basically means for every pair of them, the GCD of every pair of them is 1. So basically, uh, for all i, for all j, uh, if i does not equal j, that implies that the GCD of n i and j is equal to 1. Conventionally, usually, your prime moduli are, then your moduli are going to be prime. Here, 
n1 through nk are just the 3, the 5, and the 7, right? Those are the, we'll call those the, the, the moduli, and we'll require that they be pairwise relatively prime. Conveniently here, look, 3, 5, and 7 are prime, right? Uh, 2, uh, let r1, rk, be remainders. So that means for all i, that 0 is less than equal to ri is less than equal to ni. And ri is some number between 0 and ni, right? So 2 is less than 3, 3 is less than 5, uh, uh, 2 is less than 7. Um, then there exists a unique solution. x to, uh, x is congruent to r1 mod n1, x is congruent to rk mod nk, uh, where x is unique mod n, uh, where n is equal to n1 times n2 times dot, dot, dot times n to the k, right? What I mean by unique mod n is that 23 is the solution to this one, but what is 3 times 5 times 7? 105. 105 plus 23 also will be a solution to this. 105 times 2 plus 23 will also be a solution to this. So in fact, there are infinitely many solutions, but you're concerned with the solution mod capital N, which is between uh, 0 and N, capital N minus 1. And capital N is just the product of all the moduli, which again are pairwise relatively prime. Right? Questions on just the statement of the formula, statement of the, of the theorem. Chinese remainder theorem, two things today. I think it's important that you see a lot of proofs. Like It's important you know how to do proofs, because proofs help you think. It's about rationality. It's about the discourse. So we're going to prove that a solution exists. And then we'll prove the solution is unique. And then we'll talk about calculation. But before we get into that, any questions on the Chinese remainder theorem in general? Just the statement, the form? We understand what the statement is. x is a simultaneous sol solution to k linear congruences. Right? All right, let's go on to the proof. Now, we want to prove. Uh, the, that a solution exists, and then we want to prove that such a solution is unique. So here's how the proof of the solution exists is going to work. Basically, uh, let uh, n equal the product of n1 times uh, nk. Uh, let uh, ni, capital Ni, equal capital N over Ni, which is going to be equal to n1 times n2 times, th 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 times ni minus 1 times n i plus 1 times dot, 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 times n to the k, right? So we're going to let capital n i equal the product of all the moduli except the ith one, right? That is just n over n i. Do we agree? Anyone confused with the notation yet? Simple statement, right? Um, n uh, notice the GCD of capital Ni and lowercase ni is equal to what? And of course, let the remainders be that, and Ni are all rel pairwise relatively prime. What should, the, what should the GCD of capital Ni and lowercase ni be? Yeah. One. Why? Because Ni is not a factor of Ni. Or exactly. Small. Yeah, sorry. I, I did the whole proof. It looks great on paper. It's not going to look great saying out loud because Ni and Ni are capital Ni, and you know what I'm saying? So we'll. Be patient with me on this one. Uh, it looks good on the page. It doesn't sound good coming out. That's true because ni, the other, lower, the other, pro, the other moduli are always pairwise relatively prime. So ni doesn't divide into any of them as well. right? Um, so we know that capital ni inverse exists mod lowercase ni. Right? What that means is that capital Ni times capital Ni inverse is congruent to 1 mod Ni, right? If we multiply uh, 
multiply both sides by ri. We'll get ni times ni inverse times ri is congruent to ri mod ni. Do you agree with this statement so far? Anyone's lost or stuck? Any unexplained details I've made? Yes? Ni inverse exists mod ni. Yes. Good. Recall we proved that, that if the GCT of two numbers is 1, then the inverse exists mod n, right? Ni inverse, capital Ni inverse, is some number that when you multiply it by Ni, you'll get 1, right? What was the question? OK, clear on that? Yep. Yeah, awesome. Um, and then from here, we simply multiply both sides by Ri. The point of this is we want a congruence to an uh, equal Ri, right? Mod Ni. Uh, let uh, Xi equal Ni inverse times Ri. And let, uh, so then we know that ni times xi is congruent to ri mod ni, right? Uh, consider x is equal to the sum of i is equal to 1 to k of ni xi. An inverse is only defined with respect to a group, by the way. So this xi contains the inverse ni, but ni only acts like an inverse when you mod it. For example, what is the inverse of 2 uh, is congruent to what mod 5? Because 3 times 2 is 6 mod 5 is 1. Uh, what is the inverse of 2 mod 11? This will take us a second. Tell me what the inverse of 2 is mod 11. 6. six. You can compute the inverse using the extended Euclidean algorithm. Sometimes for small moduli, it's quick to just try all the numbers. 2 times 2, no. 2 times 3. No, 2 times 4, no, 2 times 5, no, 2 times 6, oh, great, 1. That's how, that's how it works, right? So the inverse is only defined respective to the moduli. It's only an inverse with respect to a certain moduli. So we're, it's not an inverse anymore. Now it's just a number, OK? That's why we're writing it as xi, right? Um, uh, what is uh, x? mod n1. x mod n1, basically, when you take something and you mod it by n1, you take anything that has a factor of uh, n1, and you that's just going to be congruent to 0, right? Anything with n1 as a multiple is going to be congruent to 0. So you want the things that are not multiples of n1, right? So what is x going to be mod n1? Here's, a, here's another quick question. What is the GCD of, let's say, n, capital N1, and lowercase uh, n2? n2? n2, why? Because n2 is a factor of capital N1. Correct. n1 is all of the numbers except n1. So n2 is defined to be a product of this, right? So this is going to be a summation. x is going to be equal to n1 x1 plus n2 x2 plus. When you mod by n1, what is x mod n1 is going to be then? x mod 
N1 is then equal to what? Well, will say congruent. X is congruent to what mod N1? Well, let's go through the term by term. N2 contains N1 as a factor. So when you mod that by N1, it's going to go to 0. N3 is going to go to 0. N4 is going to go to 0. N5 is going to go to 0. The only one when you mod by N1 that doesn't go to 0 is going to be N1x1. Right? And we know x1 is just ni inverse ri. So what is this equal to, congruent to? x1. What is x1? ni inverse ri. Yes. So and what is that? Or n, n1 inverse ri. Sorry, yeah. What is that? R1. So in fact, what is uh, x congruent to mod uh, ni? Ri. Ri. It's set up in such a way so that all the other parts hide when you mod it by ni except the ith one. So ri is constructed in such a way such that it'll x, you mean x is constructed in such a way, so that x will be ri exactly and only when you mod it by ni, because the rest of the numbers are multiplied by ni. So in some sense, it's like shadowed away, and then only the ri remains, sort of by definition. We do this linear combination to construct such an x. So such an x must exist. This, I think, tricky proof. Questions on this so far? Details missed? Convince yourself that x is a simultaneous solution to all of, all of them. Right? You take x as defined here. You mod it by ni, you'll always get ri. Therefore, x is a solution uh, to the k linear congruences. Right? Questions on that so far? Anyone lost or stuck on any details of the proof? We're convinced. We're seeing questionable faces. I'll just make sure we understand. Does anyone not convinced by the proof? Okay. We've proven such an, a solution exists. Now we want to prove that it's unique. How do you do a proof of uniqueness? Sorry, what? All right. How would you prove uniqueness? Say that there exists two possible solutions and prove that they're the same. Yes. So what we're going to do is... Assume to the contrary, uh, x, x prime exists uh, such that x is not congruent to x prime mod n, but x, is, x and x prime are both solutions to the same set of linear congruences. x is congruent to r1 mod lowercase n1, x is congruent to rk, mod n to the k, and x prime is congruent to r1, mod n1, x prime is congruent to rk, mod n to the k. Right. Suppose x and x prime are both simultaneous solutions, yet they are not congruent mod n. Capital N is the product of all the moduli, right? There's, suppose that, sure, we know there exists a solution. Suppose there exists two unique solutions mod n, right? We want to conclude that they're both the same. Um, so if x is congruent to ri mod ni, and x is congruent, x prime is congruent to ri mod ni, then we know that x is congruent to x prime mod ni for all i. So we also know that x minus x prime is congruent to 0 mod ni, right? So there exists some ci such that 
uh, x minus x prime is equal to c i n i by definition of uh, mod zero, right? Um, but then what do we know about n i and x minus x prime? It is congruent to zero mod x minus x prime is congruent to zero mod n i. But what does that mean about n i and x minus x prime? Uh, this is like an open-ended question. I don't expect you to jump to the answer here. But if if you see something as a multiple of it, what does that tell you about n i and x minus x prime? N i will divide into x minus x prime. So we know that for all i that n i divides into x minus x prime. Do you agree? We get then that n 1 divides into x minus x prime, n 2 divides into x minus x prime, n k divides into x minus x prime. And I was working through the proof here. I got stuck on a step. And I was wondering how much harder would I have to make the proof to diverge into a small lemma to come back and hopefully finish what we want. And it turns out, uh, by sheer luck, I don't have to prove that lemma because I gave it to you on the last worksheet. Totally coincidental. Does anyone remember the harder problem, the number theory problem on the last worksheet? If the GCD of A and B is equal to one, a one, and A divides N, B divides N, that implies that AB divides N. Right? You recall we did this, we had to prove this using Bayesuits. We said C is C times 1 times AS plus BT, and then we pulled out the AB, right, Into, from, from N. Um, but notice that if we assume this as a lemma, that something should immediately follow from here. We have n1 through nk all divided into x minus x prime. We also know that, x mi that n1 through nk are all pairwise relatively prime. So what does that tell you will divide into x minus x prime? Hmm? Zero will divide into x minus x prime? Zero will divide into every, mm, not quite zero. N, capital N. Basically, you apply the lemma k times. Because N1 and N2 are pairwise relatively prime, N1 times M2, M2 divides into x minus x prime. Then N1 times M2, N2 times N3 divides into x minus x prime. That times N4 divides into x prime, and so on. So you apply the lemma k times, you get that N1 times all the way to NK divides into x minus x prime. So you get that capital N divides into x minus x prime. What do you know about this if this div if n divides into x minus x prime, then there exists some c such that n c is equal to x minus n prime. X minus, yeah, x minus x prime. So what that means is that x minus x prime is congruent to 0 mod n, capital N. From there, we conclude that x is congruent to x prime mod n, not distinct. Contradiction. Certainly, the proof of uniqueness is simpler than the proof of existence. Questions on this proof? Uniqueness proofs come up all the time. Very common stuff to do. Almost formulaic how you start. You saw how we got stuck here. We had to prove a little lemma. We got lucky. So, questions on this? All right, let's talk about how you actually solve a system of linear inequations. Um, there are two methods to solving a system uh, using the Chinese remainder theorem. One is a way I would love to think that I invented, but I Googled it, and it's really common, and it's out there, and everyone else knows it already. So I'm not that smart in that regard. And it's basically just Gaussian elimination. The second way is a more textbook table way, which kind of involves the proof. So suppose we have this system of equations. We want to actually find x. We were able to quickly brute force this 23. Before you try to solve for x, what you have to do first is double check that you can do it. 
Are these pairwise relatively prime? Well, because they're all prime, actually that follows trivially. But what you do is check every pair of moduli, make sure they're pairwise relatively prime. If they're not relatively prime, the whole thing falls apart, unfortunately. The uniqueness proof here, uh, excuse me, not the uniqueness, the existence proof relies on the pairwise relatively primeness. And even the uniqueness proof relied on the pairwise relatively primeness, right? So double check, because sometimes they're not. And you will have to, like rubric-wise, double check that it is pairwise relatively prime. Three, five, seven, pairwise relatively prime, great. What we're going to do is use Gaussian elimination to solve for this in a multiplicative sense. We're going to solve for the largest equation, plug it into the smaller equation, plug that into the smaller equation, and so on, until we're left with the answer that we want. Right? So let's say we know that seven is, uh, x is congruent to 2 mod 7. What you want to do is take the largest moduli and plug that into the next smallest one, the next largest one. So if x is congruent to 2 mod 7, we know that x is, in fact, equal to 7k plus 2 uh, for some k. Do we agree? So what we're going to do is just plug in x here. We know, then, that 7k plus 2 is congruent to 3 mod 5. Took this one, converted its form, plugged it in here. All we did. Now, what is 7 mod 5? Okay, so we get 2k is congruent to, what is 3 minus 2 is 1, so we're going to subtract 2 from both sides. Um, what is k? Three. 3. You're going to compute the inverse of 2, you're going to get k. So k is not necessarily equal to 2, but congruent to 2. So in fact, we use another letter. Let's use L. k is, in fact, equal to 5L plus 2. Yes? I said that k was 3. Oh, k is 3. Thank you. I didn't do that to test you. I genuinely messed up. So k is, k is congruent to 3. K is congruent to 3 mod 5 means there is some number L such that K is equal to 5L plus 3, right? Well, what are we going to do is we're going to plug this back into X. So we're going to get X is equal to 7 times 5L plus 3 plus 2, okay? Now, what is uh, 5 times 7? That's 35, but I'm going to leave it as 5 times 7 for a reason. We're going to 5 times 7, L, plus 7 times 3, 7 from 21, 23. Okay. Notice that I've reduced the letter, but I changed the modulus from the 7 to the 5 times 7. We're going to do it one more time, and then we're going to get X is congruent. X is equal to 3 times 5 times 7, plus another new letter, plus some remainder. So now we know that x is equal to 5 times 7l plus 23. Let's solve for l in the first equation. So you take this one, plug it into this one. Take that one, we're going to plug it into that one, right? So we know 35l is congruent, excuse me, 35l plus 23 is congruent to 2 mod 3. What is 35 mod 3? 2. 33, 34, yeah, 2l. What's 23 mod 3? 2. 2 mod 3 is 2. Okay. Well, we have 2 on both sides. Let's subtract 2 from both sides. We'll get 2L is congruent to 0 mod 3. What is L? Zero. Actually, so it's like saying 12 o'clock on the clock. In computer science, we say 0, right? You go 1 through 11. It is 3, but 3 is actually 0. So L is congruent to 0 mod 3. So we know, sorry, running out of room here, that L is equal to 3, K, three give me another letter. N. N? M? N. M, M plus 0, right? Because L is congruent to 0 mod 3. L is equal to 3M plus 0. 
We're going to plug that into x. So we get x is equal to uh, 5 times 7 times 3m plus 0 plus 23. And that's going to give us x is equal to 3 times 5 times 7m plus 23. Do we agree? Now you're only looking for a solution mod n. So what happens when you mod x by uh, 3 times 5 times 7? x mod 3 times 5 times 7, which is what, by the way? 3 times 5 times 7 mod 3 times 5 times 7 is 0. But what is 3 times 5 times 7 before that? 105. 105, right? So what is this going to be congruent to? Twenty-three. That is going to be your remainder. That's the original answer we got as well. Twenty-three. So you take the equation, uh, put it into the divisor form, plug it into the next highest equation, plug it into the next highest equation, plug it into the next highest equation. You want to also start from the bigger letters. So because this, if you go in increasing, seven is going to always decrease when you modify the one previous. But five mod seven may not get smaller, but seven mod five will get smaller, right? So you want to go biggest to smallest necessarily, and it's simple. It's easy to remember. The tricky part with this is sometimes you have to compute the inverse, right? We have to like look again, okay, what is the inverse of 2? Well, it's 3. You check a little bit, right? Not exactly the simplest way for large n, it turns out. But in fact, it is the, uh, I think it's an easier to memorize way when you're trying to find a solution. Any questions on this method? If I gave you a system of linear equations, I asked you to solve for it, you guys could do it, right? Yes? In the first step, where it's x is equal to 7k plus 2. I looked at the largest equation, and if x is congruent to 2 mod 7, we know that there exists some number k such that 7, x is equal to 7k plus 2. That is something that you may assume by uh, like how modular arithmetic works. If x is congruent to r mod n, then there exists some k such that x is equal to kn plus r. Right. You could also say x minus r is congruent to 0 mod n, and then you have x minus r is congruent to kn, and then you put the r back. Right. This is the divisor form. You can, go it's in, uh, you can go between those two. That's a good superpower to have. Yes? How do you get from 7k plus 2 is 3 to 2k is 1? I subtracted 2 from both sides. So I'm going to get 7k plus 0 is congruent to 1. Then 7 mod 5, remember, you, if it's multiplying, you can just mod, it, mod out 7. 7 mod 5 is just 2. Does that make sense? So I literally took 7. 7, 7 k mod 5 is 7 mod 5 k mod 5. So it's just 2 k. Yeah. You go that way. You, you solve for k. You solve for l. You solve for uh, m. You'll get something that looks like the product of the moduli times a letter you don't have to solve for, plus a remainder. So when you mod by this moduli, you'll just get the remainder. That's your answer. Let's uh, do any more questions on this form before I show you the, the perhaps more routine way to do solve for Chinese remainder theorems, linear inequalities. The other way to solve for Chinese remainder theorem, linear inequalities, is to, um, and I'll leave this board up here just so we can we have something to look at. Is to just basically we constructed a certain x using uh, we constructed a certain x to show it exists. The other way to find such an x is basically to follow that construction and compute it manually. So let's just do that. So we said x is equal to the sum of i is equal to 1 to k of n i x i. Uh, and x i was equal to n i inverse r i. But be careful, that's only an inverse uh, mod n i, lowercase n i. Right? It's, not, it's not like an inverse in general. And we want to consider an inverse in general in a different uh, in a different world, in a capital N. So let's call it, uh, call it uh, n i prime, right? So we're not going to call it n i inverse because that's only an inverse some of the time. We want to consider an inverse 
not an inverse, but a number in a general, uh, in a different system, right? So it's going to be x is going to be equal to the sum of uh, i is equal to 1 to k of n i, n i prime r i. You simply compute the sum of these products, and that, that's going to give you your answer, right? So let's just do the table way. Let's say we put the n i's here, we'll put the r i's here, and we'll put the capital n i is equal to n over n i here. Let's solve the same uh, ancient puzzle. This is the same one they found in a scroll in a jar or whatever, right? So this is put 3, 5, and 7 are our moduli. Our remainders are 2, 3, and 2, right? Uh, what is n1? Three, 35, yes. Now here's the bad way to do it. Compute n as 3 times 5 times 7, which is 105, and then divide by 3. So what is 105 divided by 3? is 35. That's the harder way to do it. The easier way is just ignore this and do this multiplication. So you can do the multiplication sometimes faster than you can do division. If you can do division fast, good for you. I can't. Uh, neither can computers, in fact. So we'll do uh, the multiplication of the ones that are not in. What is n2? 21. 3 times 7 is 21. What is uh, n3? 15. Yes. Just to be clear, this is uh, 5 times 7. This is 3 times 7. And this is 3 times 5, right? Now we know what ni is. We want to compute ni prime which is the multiplicative inverse mod um, ni. So what is, an, what is uh, we have 35 n1 prime uh, is congruent to 1 mod uh, n1. So this is going to be 35 n1 prime is congruent to 1 mod 3, right? We want to solve for n1 prime. N1 prime is the inverse of 35. This is just the definition of inverse. What is 35 mod 3? 2? So we get 2N1 is congruent to 1 mod 3. And just sort of brute force this, what should N1 prime be? 3. 3? Three? 3 times 2 is 6. Is 6 mod 3 is 0. Um, 2. I have 2. So we know that N1 prime is congruent to 2. We'll just put 2 here. Um, let's do it again. We want 21 n2 primes congruent to 1 mod 5. We're going to simplify. What is 21 mod 5? 1. So we know that n2 prime is congruent to 1 mod 5. So in fact, n2 prime was the identity. So it's its, it's, it's, its own inverse. Uh, what about the last one? We'll do 15n3 prime is congruent to 1 mod 7. What is 15 mod 7? 1. So we get n3 prime is congruent to 1 mod 7. n3 is also an inverse mod, uh, but mod 7. Um, so we have ni. We have ni prime, and we have ri. So let's compute ni times ni prime times ri. What is ni times ni prime times, what is n1 times n1 prime times r1? It's okay to use a calculator. 140. 140. I got 140 as well. That's going to be 35 times 2 times 2. So 35 times 2, 70 times 2 is 140. Yeah, OK. What is uh, n2? 63. Let's double check. 21 times 1 times 3 is 63. OK. What is n3 times n3 prime times r1 is going to be 15 times, yes, it's 30. All right. 
now we have completed the table. Now we simply need to um, compute the sum. Uh, we know that x is then equal to 140 plus 63 plus 30. What is that? 233. So we know x is congruent to 233 uh, mod. Uh, 2 times 3 times 5 is 105. Well, we only want the solution mod 105. So what is 233 mod 105? If you have trouble doing a mod, like sometimes you're on an exam, you have pen and paper. The way to do mod quickly is also to sub subtract 105 from it a couple times until it gets negative and you can't do it anymore. So you subtract 105 from that, you're going to get something. You subtract 105 from it again, you'll get something. What should it be? 23, yeah. So x is equal to 23. The table way is a little more routine. It's perhaps easier to memorize. But uh, notice that they're basically the same. When we did the Gaussian elimination method, you have to still compute the inverses to plug them back in. Here, you compute the inverses all at once, and then you do the product all at the end. Right? It's basic, the same thing basically occurs, if you think about it. I personally prefer the Gaussian elimination way because I memorized it. It's not you need to know every way to do something. You just need to know one way to do something, and then you're fine. I prefer the Gaussian elimination way. Some of you may prefer the table way. Maybe it's better if you're trying to compute something like this to do the table way. You know, you'll have you should develop a preference. Chocolate or vanilla, it's the same. All right. Questions? Yes. Ah, the the definition of an inverse. We know n i prime is supposed to actually be n i inverse mod little n i. But I only learned it as ni prime because it was outside of the thing. The definition of an inverse, a inverse, is a number such that a times a inverse is congruent to a inverse times a is congruent to 1 mod n. Right? So we took, we were looking for the inverse of 35 mod 3. So I did 35 times this number is congruent to 1. Then we solve for n1 prime. And then that gives us the inverse. In general, you want to, if, if, you, know, if, you, if you know it's an inverse of something, it's like as is congruent to 1 mod n implies that s is equal, s is congruent to a inverse mod n, right? If the inverse exists. The inverse may not exist. So questions on that? In computing the inverse, by the way, is usually a relatively difficult problem, just like final comments. Like, in general, we mentioned you can do it with the extended Euclidean algorithm, and you have to use Bayesuits to compute that, and then you get, you get your answer back. But when the numbers are small, the best thing you should do is just brute force it, right? Like, we computed the inverse of 2 mod 11. You just tried a couple numbers. You found 6. OK, good for you. you know? You're not going to, it's going to be more work sometimes if you delegate to something bigger. But if you try a bigger number, like, I don't know, 105 or something like this, right? Computing inverses mod that is going to be difficult. You don't want to try 100 numbers. So you, you'll do the extended Euclidean algorithm, something like this. You got to know what tool, well, you have, you're building a toolbox, discrete math in general. I'm, we're giving you a big chunk, a big chest of tools. You have to know when to pull them out, when to apply them. Right? Final questions on the uh, Chinese remainder theorem? <laughs> really, that girl of number theory. Excellent, excellent. <laughs>